being told and it's tending to really pee me off at the moment because it shouldn't be the fact, but it tends to be the way that people are, are thinking about their nutrition. I don't think that should be the case. So let's have a look. Um, so we're going to go through and we're going to set the scene, okay? So um, let's set the scene about what we're talking about here. We'll talk about nutrition and conduct connecting the dots to everything uh, and how nutrition is central to everything. And then we'll talk about C, six key habits to improve body composition because the most common thing in Q4 for probably the majority of athletes that we're certainly speaking to is in Q4 in that postseason period, they want to try and improve their body composition. Okay, so setting the scene. I think the first thing about that whole statement, like no more races, therefore I don't need to worry about my nutrition. For me, what that instantly says is that you've probably spent the entire season trying to get to what you consider your ideal uh, race weight or your body composition. And now you're willing to sort of just go, you know what, I'm just going to give it away for the next three or four months. And then I'm just going to start the season again as I started this season and have to go through that whole process again. The way that I would be thinking about it from a mindset perspective is like I spent so much time and potentially some periods of time in caloric restriction in order to reduce body weight and body fat during that season, which is the less than optimal time to be trying to improve body composition. So rather than thinking about, okay, I can just put on a heap of fat and then start again, why not at least try and maintain what you've achieved fuel correctly throughout that off season period where you're maybe doing some different training and then hit the start of the season, not necessarily at race weight, but in great physical condition. So then you can sort of uh, alternate or sort of go through the season and pick precise moments in time where you actually want to get to your race weight. And if you do that, it's going to be a much better 2024. And I guess this relates to this. Nutrition just doesn't stop with racing. Majority of you probably got into the sport of triathlon to be healthy. And if you completely, regardless if you're training for races or just training in general for general health or improvements in body composition, improvements in lean muscle, um, improvements in maybe aerobic capacity, nutrition is still going to play a central role in that. So I think getting rid of that notion of just okay, no more races, no more nutrition needs to be eliminated. And that, that's that new mindset. So what are you going to be doing in Q4 that may be different and hopefully is quite different to the training you actually did during the season? So is it high volume uh, weights training? So less weight, higher volume, shorter rest periods with the goal of creating muscular hypertrophy. Well, you need to, approach that with nutrition in mind because if you don't fuel your body either before that weight training session and certainly post training with the appropriate amount of protein and certainly carbohydrates then that training stimulus may not be as good as what it could be if you neglect nutrition and that's really important as well whatever that deficit is that you want to try and approach in the q4 be specific with what that training is and then apply specific nutrition to that Ooh, number five came up enjoyment obviously reclaim food as a food as a as a um as a source of enjoyment and i think one of the best things i was interviewing uh sky munch uh recently or munch i should say um about like describe fuel in in three words and one of her words was happy and it was the first time not the first time i've ever heard that fuel in makes people happy but it was a really nice succinct description of what fueling has done for her over the last six months. And the reason it made her happy is because she remembered how good food was and how important food was to making her feel happy. And when she was happy, ultimately her husband was happy and the family was happy. And as a result, her race performance sort of accelerated as you've all seen. So I think don't forget about, you know, food should be about making you happy. And you don't always have to be in this sort of, you know, state of I'm trying to lose weight. I'm trying to lose weight. There can be periods of time where you're just happy with where you're at and actually train the house down and not be in that caloric deficit. 
and that sort of relates to health. And I t- touched on that initially, like, you know, you all probably got into this sport to improve your health. And I think that's really important for everyone to remember. You know, when you, when you are thinking about what you're doing in Q4, how it applies to next season, remember that this is a sport about health and that should be first and foremost. So don't do unhealthy practices um, during the off season or certainly during the next season that, you know, are going to bring sort of a detrimental effect to you. And then in terms of habits and layering it, I think pretty much anyone who's ever talked to me one-on-one or anything like that, I'll talk about like James Clear and Atomic, Atomic Habits. If you haven't bought the book, certainly buy it because it really resonates with me in terms of habit formation and how to apply that in a practical way to your life. And it, it's such a clear book on how you can bring not just nutrition, but then other habits that maybe involve things like sleep or training into your life in a manner that is actually going to be practical and achievable for you. So as what we're going to touch on now is that that notion that nu- nutrition really is, as it says, central to health and performance. And what I hope I can show you is that nutrition, the impact of nutrition is certainly profound in so many different aspects of life. So it is a bit of a circle um, and we will go through the circle. Okay. So what we often talk about in, uh, or what's often talked about in social media and, um, and sort of research is that sleep impacts nutrition, but what's not often talked about is the impact that nutrition can have on sleep. So, We know that if you, and this is a very simple thing, so I'm going to give you some very clear takeaways from each of the perspectives around nutrition, sleep, and the other um, factors that we're going to talk about. So from a nutrition perspective, in terms of nutrition impacting sleep, a lot of people go searching for answers. They're wearing aura rings, they're wearing whoop, but they don't actually know what to do. The simple answer is that if you consume between six and nine serves of fruit and vegetables per day, there is good research and good evidence that that will improve your sleep duration and your sleep quality. So before reaching for supplements, melatonin, magnesium, all these other things that could also improve sleep and they are part of nutrition, simply focus on the simplest method or the simplest habit that you can implement into your daily activity or daily routine of eating at least two pieces of fruit and at least six different types of vegetables. And that will have a significant impact on your sleep quality. Okay. In terms of how, I don't know what's going on with the presentation. So how sleep will impact nutrition. So sleep will have a negative impact on nutrition in that if you have less than seven hours sleep, it has been shown in the research that this will increase hedonistic drive towards sweet and fatty foods. So when you are tired, you will have less clear thought process around what foods to consume. And you will be driven towards sweeter and fattier foods because they obviously make you feel good. So from a very clear takeaway standpoint from this, ensure that you get at least seven to nine hours sleep per night, and that will have a positive impact on nutrition. The next part in terms of nutrition, I don't know why the little thing has popped up. So we're going to look at then good nutrition choices as a result of getting good night's sleep and how that nutrition is going to impact health. So the simple thing we can talk about here is omega-3s. So yes, there is correlation. A lot of it is based along longitudinal studies, but high intake of omega-3 fatty acids, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids, they will have a positive impact on your health from reduction in uh, all-cause mortality from cancers, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases. If you have an omega-3 index of between 8 and 12%, you will have a reduced risk of developing those types of diseases. So the clear takeaway from this is that fat, fatty, oily, uh, oily 
fatty fish should be consumed ideally on a daily basis. And if you cannot consume them on a daily basis, you should use a high quality fish oil and aim to consume depending on what your omega-3 index is. But if your omega-3 index is less than that 8%, the recommendation would be somewhere between three and 4,000 milligrams of EPA DHA. The simple takeaway message from this is get your omega quant, uh, your omega-3 index tested through a company called Omega Quant. I have no affiliation with Omega Quant. We did do a talk with Dr. Bill Harris uh, recently, and we had 36 athletes supply their data for their Omega-3 index. What I would consider as a healthy cohort in America, and I think all but three, uh, all but four participants were from America, I would have said that you were all a fairly healthy cohort. And remember the marker is between eight and 12%. The mean and the median for that group of 36 people was 5.2%. So just under half of what it should be. Now we've been getting back uh, follow-up tests as, as a result of taking three between three and 4,000 milligrams of EPA DHA. Surprise, surprise, all their levels have been increased. Some as high as 10%, but majority are now above 8%, which is really great to see. But the point being, you don't know unless you test it. So get your test done with Omega Quant basic test. Um, I don't think the 20% code works anymore, but you can try it. Um, it was fuel in 20 and that gives 20% off the test, but it's a fantastic test. It's very actionable and you can do something about it. Okay. Um, the next bit is about health and how is health impacted by nutrition. So we talked about omega-3s and obviously that nutrition element impacting health, but we also know that health can be impacted through nutrition. So fruit and vegetables obviously um, are something we talked about in relation to sleep, but they also do, and we're talking about something um, in terms of an element that a lot of athletes will need, and that is magnesium. So fruit and vegetables will contain magnesium. Um, it is one of those uh, one of those nutritional uh, micronutrients that will become deplete in an athletic population. I'll refer to a British study that they did on British athletes, obviously very high performing. And it was found, and this was in 2000, I think it was 2016. I'll check that. 22% um, of the athletes were identified as being clinically deficient of magnesium, of red blood cell magnesium. Um, what was really interesting that athletes who had tendon issues, so Achilles and patella tendon injuries, had significantly lower red blood cell magnesium status as well. Female athletes and black athletes also had lower status for red blood cell magnesium. Um, and so in terms of injuries and then how it related, there was a positive correlation between potential muscle injuries and magnesium deficiency. And there was also a positive correlation between deficiencies in magnesium and sleep um, deficits in sleep duration and sleep quality. So the key thing here is you can get magnesium through fruit and vegetable consumption. Obviously the better quality, the soil, the better quality, the magnesium source within that fruit and vegetables. If you did require something like a magnesium supplement to either help you with sleep or just the daily amounts. The best way to think about whether you require it or not is by actually getting your magnesium levels tested. So red blood cell magnesium test is something that you can ask your doctor to do. Um, and it's a very good test to get done to check what your status are. If you're a heavy sweater as well, magnesium, um, your loss of magnesium through sweat will be higher than someone who has a low sweat rate. So that is something to also consider. Okay. Next thing. So the next one is talking, oh, I don't know, sorry. I'm just going to click these through so that you see them. Okay. So the bottom one is then health and uh, sorry, nutrition. And how does nutrition impact training? I think this really comes back to a couple of key principles. So certainly net protein balance. If in Q4, as I said, you're looking at doing high volume weights training, and you're looking at increasing lean muscle mass and certainly increasing strength and power, then nutrition is gonna play a critical role to that training stimulus. If net protein balance is in a negative state or in a catabolic state, 
you are not going to be able to put on lean mass. And that also applies to being in a caloric surplus or at least in an isocaloric state. So if your main goal is to put on lean muscle, you should not be trying to be in a caloric deficit at the same time. Um, I talked about a study that was recently done on uh, 30 women where they were in low energy availability versus optimal energy availability. Yes, the group that was in low energy availability lost fat mass, but they also lost muscle mass. The group that was in optimal energy availability lost a little bit of fat mass, but actually gained lean muscle mass. And this is really important. If you are on the fuel end app, what I would suggest, even if you're in the off season and you're clicking body composition, align your current body weight with your goal weight and have them the same for a time, for at least you know a training block period so that you're not being pushed into a caloric deficit. And that's something really important for any of the athletes listening there. Um, obviously, energy availability is going to be impacted by nutrition. So as I said, energy balance is required, i.e. a caloric deficit to lose body fat or lose weight. However, energy availability needs to be positive so that or at least over a, a no more than a six to 10 day period so that you're not going to be uh, negatively impacted by low energy availability. So again, nutrition will have a significant impact on that energy balance and on that energy availability. It is a tricky equation, which is obviously why, you know, we have created what we've created to try and take out that guesswork and allow you just to actually fuel correctly. So if you haven't seen what we do, and I know pretty much all the athletes on here understand that, but for anyone who is listening and watching this on YouTube, certainly have a look at the way in which we structure training programs so that you avoid going into a low energy balance and low energy availability. Um, next one would be how training uh, can impact nutrition or nutrition can impact training in the other way. So I think a lot of athletes talk about improving uh, fat max um, in or maximal fat oxidation in the off season and trying to improve their ability to burn fat. Now that will be significantly impacted by the nutrition that you consume. So yes, you can be pushed into a faster rate of fat oxidation if you go on a very high fat diet. And that can be in a very short period of time, say five to seven days. However, if you do that, that will also negatively impact your ability to use carbohydrates at a high rate. And so the question is, is do you want to try and fast track the ability to use fat as a fuel source and potentially have a detrimental impact to your ability to use carbs? Or are you better about better off going about this in a slower systematic manner, whereby the driver might be that you're finishing sessions in a slightly lower glycogen state. You're not necessarily replenishing the full amount of glycogen. And so that over the course of weeks, and potentially, you know, two to three months of good solid training at lower intensity with some higher intensity training thrown in, you will most likely shift your curve to the right, improve your ability to use fat as a fuel source, yet you will not negatively impact that ability to use carbs as a fuel source when the intensity is high. And I think the biggest thing now, when we look at the racing that's being done, you are requiring carbohydrates like no other time in the history or of the sport of triathlon. Everyone is going, you know, definitely over 65% of their VO2 max and certainly redlining uh, for the majority. And when we look at certainly, um, you know, sprint Olympic and 70.3s, there's certainly a lot of redlining going on from pros to age groupers. And even when we're looking at the full distance racing now, I mean, it's quite incredible at which the speeds and the efforts of which every athlete from professional to age group is working. And you have to remember that after three hours of continual training, maximal fat oxidation will start to occur at the same time as maximal carbohydrate oxidation or usage, regardless of what your nutrition is. And that's really important to remember that even if you are eating carbohydrates, your ability to use fat as a fuel source is still going to be maxed out after sort of three hours continuous training regardless of what the intensity is. Okay, so some simple steps 
in regard to this. So if we think about that nutrition, what we talked about was six to nine serves of fruit and veg, break that up. You could have just two, two serves of fruit every day and then at least six serves of vegetables. Aim to get seven to nine hours sleep per night. Get the Omega-3 index. Just get the basic one. I think it's about $50. It's a fantastic test. Order two kits. So eight weeks later, you can retest. Red blood cell magnesium. Ask your doctor maybe to get it tested in your next blood test. Um, in terms of training-based nutrition and understanding energy requirements, obviously train with fuel in. If you are interested in where your metabolic flexibility is, your ability to use fat as a fuel source at rest, certainly at uh, fat max, and then what your ability to use carbohydrates, I would recommend getting a metabolic cart done, but you need to use that as a baseline, apply appropriate nu uh, nutrition and training, and then get retested again, and probably get retested around six to eight weeks, and then do that periodically throughout the post-season period, and then also into the next uh, training, into the next race season. And then finally, in terms of performance, obviously um, understanding the, the amounts of carbohydrates that you require to hit these high performances um, is really important. And then also understanding how to manage your hydration is of utmost importance if you want to be able to race at your absolute best. So from that perspective, the simple step is to many, many uh, sweat tests so sweat rate tests within fuel in and certainly a lot of carbohydrate capacity tests again in fuel in certainly for those zone three to zone five sessions certainly for bike and run at differing temperatures and certainly at temperatures that you plan on racing in when it comes around to race season now is the time in q4 to practice things like your gut training practice with new products if you want to change up what type of carbohydrate you used um, from this season because you weren't quite happy with it, start to use it in the post-season period and refine that process. So again, when you come to next season, you've got it all dialed in and you're ready to go. Does, any, does anyone have any questions on that? Sorry, I know I've been talking and talking and talking. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. So I guess the next thing was this is a screenshot from TriDot, which uh, it's actually my plan. And so I have about, I think it's about eight, eight and a half hours of training uh, per week. And I guess the point of these two screens was, okay, if you've got that on the left, do you know what sort of nutrition you should be having? Um, now, obviously most of you are on fuel in, but for those of you who aren't, um, the screen on the right is then my month, my weekly plan just to highlight, okay, the exact amounts of protein, fat, carbohydrates, and calories that are required based on the training that is applied through tri uh, through TriDot. And I guess the point of this was for most people, they have very limited idea around how much protein they should be consuming based on the training for that particular day, but also how to fit it in across the week. And certainly how much total calories, carbohydrates, and fat would be applied based on the purpose. So what we're doing is making it very simple for you to actually be able to execute your training plan with a nutrition plan. And so the screen on the left, working from left to right, is the condensed view into the day. So this would be my day-to-day, -day, um, showing that I have effectively, when you look at the middle screen, I have 60-minute threshold uh, intervals, which isn't going to be fueled because it's only 60 minutes, and then I have an easy runoff which is 30 minutes at zone one, zone two. The point being is that leading into those sessions, into those sessions, there is significant amounts of carbohydrates going to be consumed. So before I even get on the bike, I will have consumed over just around 200 grams of carbs and, and uh, consumed around 80 grams of protein and around, what's that, 30, 35 grams of fat. So I've taken in significant calories prior to this hard session, which are, zone three and a zone one run, but I'm not necessarily fueling within it because the duration of the two sessions doesn't warrant that. But this is an important consideration for you because would you know not to necessarily fuel during those sessions, but know exactly how much to fuel beforehand. So we're just trying to lay it out and show you very simply by going in from left to right, giving you an overview, 
giving you a detailed view of exactly what you're meant to be eating and what you're meant to be doing in training to if I was to click on lunch, giving you a simple option of something you could eat. Now you could easily switch out the white fish, um, you know, white fish with chicken. You could switch out the brown rice to white rice if that was your preference as well. But certainly trying to get in the total amounts of calories and the total macronutrients with good quality nutrition before a session like this. So we're gonna move on to body composition and body composition is one of those uh, tricky topics, I guess, because um, sometimes people either can get triggered by it because of past behaviors, or there, there is this common belief that maybe body composition shouldn't be talked about, even though um, having an optimal body composition is certainly going to improve your overall health. So I think when we talk about body composition and trying to improve it, and this relates back to that circle is, and talking about like your improvements in things like fat oxidation is certainly have patience. It's what you do over an extended period of time that is going to make the difference to a body to your true body composition. So yes, if you go on a high fat, low carb diet, you will probably lose anywhere from one to three kilos in the first week. A lot of that will be water weight. After a couple of weeks on it, a lot of athletes, if you are still training and training with any form of intensity, will tend to struggle. And then more often than not, um, sometimes that adherence to the diet will drop off. Obviously, the best diet, if we're going to talk about diets or best nutrition plan, is the one that works for you and the one that you can stick to consistently. So what I would say with this, rather than sort of approaching Q4 as like one month, two months, three months, Approach it that, okay, you need to stick to something for a consistent period of time. And this is, I put 60 days here. I probably should have said 90 days, but certainly be involved in your nutrition and start to learn what you're taking in on a daily basis. So I would encourage athletes who have never tracked their nutrition to track nutrition, either through my fitness pal, lose it or fuel in or a combination of all of them but do it for at least 60 days and educate yourself on what certain foods can sh uh, contain in terms of total calories and then their macronutrient breakdown and focus on good quality nutrition, whole foods, way more than just trying to attack your macros from um, you know, processed and ultra processed foods. In order to improve body composition, you do have to be in a caloric deficit, okay? So this again comes back to what is your priority in Q4, is it to improve body composition? Is it to at least maintain some lean muscle mass, but lose majority of fat mass and lose body weight? If you are looking to do that, you have to be in a caloric deficit. It doesn't have to be huge, but it, it definitely has to be that. So again, the challenge here would be stick to your fuel in program, have patience with it, but track and actually take in what fuel in is recommending to you for at least 60 days. So sorry, I don't know why it popped up for. Um, this should be number three, but uh, cook. I, I talk about this a lot, and this relates back to what Sky said about the enjoyment factor. But if you can learn to cook again and get back in the kitchen, then you can really control the controllables, as it says. If you're ordering Uber Eats or you're ordering from other companies that maybe you don't really know, especially Uber Eats from restaurants, you have no idea what is actually going into that food. And hence, tracking is probably going to be wildly inaccurate and the tracking is only as good as the person doing the tracking. So what I would encourage you, and certainly in this Q4 period, is cook at least five times a week at home and cook your meals. Cook double so that you've got dinner and you've got lunch and base that on what you're being given from the fuel in program. Do that five nights or five days a week and do it again for at least those 60 days. Talk about protein a lot. Obviously, whatever you weigh in pounds is roughly what you should be aiming for in grams per day. So if you're 160 pounds, um, if you're a 160 pound athlete, you're aiming for 160 grams per day. Now, regardless if you're male, or female, it is an appropriate target. If you're young or old, it is an appropriate target. We'll often hear, oh, I'm menopausal, I'm premenopausal, I, I should be taking in a different amount of protein to someone 
who is a male of the same age or a female younger age. No, just keep it simple. Just keep it to that amount. I can guarantee you that is more protein than you've ever consumed in your life anyway. If you haven't necessarily been involved in a performance nutrition program, start with that. Yes, there could be an argument to maybe push perimenopausal and postmenopausal up to two and a half grams per kilo body weight. But at least as a starting point, 2.2 grams per kilo of body weight is a great starting point and see if you can hit it. And again, challenge yourself to hit that number consistently for 60 days. Talked about sleep before. If you're tracking, and I don't know if anyone does track with Aura or whatnot, do you actually pay attention to the information it gives you? At the end of the week, they give you a summary. At the end of the month, they give you a summary. And at the end of the year, they give you a summary. Is your sleep hours that you're achieving, is it between seven and nine hours? And if it's not, start to do something about it. Obviously, if you are tracking, great. If you are tracking and you're having less than seven, then do something about it and actually apply yourself with a habit to get to bed earlier and wake up consistently so that you can get that seven to nine hours sleep. Oh, sorry. And then finally, again, I'll talk about it all day, but fruit and vegetables. And this is a big part of fuel in, okay? Use those fruit and vegetables to build your base for carbohydrate requirements, okay? Yes, you could argue if you've got a race or a really high intensity session, you probably drop down on fiber intake for those, uh, for those particular sessions. And we will tell you um, to reduce fiber intake in a particular meal if it's immediately before a hard session. But on the whole, aim for six to nine serves of fruit and vegetables. Um, I put in here, you can look at it another way. If you want to go in grams, aim for 600 to 900 grams of fruit and vegetables per day. And that's another way of looking at it if you want to go down that route. But certainly pick, you know, as I said, pick seven or six different fruit, uh, different vegetables per day and make a little game trying to eat varied, um, you know, intake of those vegetables. And certainly for fruit, you know, pick a couple of seasonal uh, fruit and, and eat it on a particular day. Again, challenge yourself. Try and do it for 60 days and see what happens. Okay, three key habits. Obviously, Vegemite is important. Where is mine? So if I was going to pick my Q4 um, you know, habits that I really want to implement, um, obviously talking about the six on the before, I do pretty much most of those uh, on a daily basis. And that's something I work really hard at. So for me, having come off training uh, from the last period for this year, which has been a very different year for me because it's been very endurance focused, getting involved in, in the community and sort of experiencing what you all go through on a, a yearly basis. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting back into some high volume weights and doing uh, a lot of repetitions with lighter weight um, and lots of reps with short rest. Uh, just mainly to improve a little bit of muscle development uh, where I feel like I've lost some over the period of time because of the high volume of endurance training. Certainly Vegemite on toast is something I'm building into my habit. I had two pieces this morning on sourdough. The reason for that is because it's a nutritional yeast and it's actually one of the best sources of B vitamins. So from uh, B3, B3, B6, B9 and B12, it's a fantastic source of those B vitamins. I'm historically quite low on B vitamins. So I'm going to actually be implementing this and seeing if I can use this instead of a supplement to see if I can improve my B level, um, B, uh, B vitamin levels. And then the final thing, because we're coming into Q4 or certainly holiday period uh, down under, I'm looking at implementing alcohol-free beer, certainly having that in my fridge as the mainstay so that I don't have temptation to reach for a full strength beer and then trying to drink alcohol free beer at a more regular um, cadence when out and out and about so that I can actually get up and train the next day and not feel bad about it. So they're mine. Um, obviously, these are just some that I threw out. Uh, we talked about omega-3s. Pickled herring is probably, well, it is the best source of EPA omega-3s, um, polyunsaturated. That may be something that you build in, certainly sleeping seven to nine hours a day or a night and working on your program in terms of reverse engineering going, okay, I need to get seven hours. I'm waking up at this time. Let's allow at least a one and a half to two hour buffer in that 
what time do I have to be asleep by? And therefore, I need to get into bed at least probably 30 to 45 minutes before bed to enable me to get that seven hours of sleep. And then lastly, if you're not consuming that six to nine serves of fruit and vegetable, then make it a habit. I can guarantee you, if you go about eating six serves of vegetables a day and two pieces of fruit, if your goal is to improve body composition, I can guarantee it will happen. Cool. That's it for me. Um, please turn on your cameras if you'd like to. Uh, and yeah, ask some questions if you want. Any questions? Come on, someone else. Lara, you must have a question. Okay, I've got a question. Um, Cindy's at work, so she can't. Um, oh, Dustin, do you want to ask a question anyway? It doesn't matter if you don't have a camera. Uh, no, I don't think I have any questions. Got really good stuff, though. Cool. Do you, let's, uh, well, Dust, I'll put you on the spot. What's, uh, sure. in terms of the circle, so if we think about that and we go, okay, sleep impacting, uh, sorry, nutrition impacting sleep, were you aware of fruit and vegetables having a significant positive impact on fruit, on sleep? Uh, no, that was, that was surprising to me. You know, it's, it's something where, you know, you know that they're good for you, just gen generally speaking, but, uh, having a positive impact on sleep was something new to me. So that's, that's really good info for sure. Yeah. And, and the mechanistic, well, the, the mechanism behind it is that, and, and it's not a hundred percent clearly understood, but about 90 to 95% of serotonin is produced actually in the gut. I don't know if everyone knew that most people think serotonin, they think the brain, but about 90 to 95% is produced in the butt, the gut, not the butt. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, when we think of fruit and vegetables, what do fruit and vegetables contain that the microbiome like? What do they contain? Does anyone know? Come on, have a stab. Fiber? What, what? Fiber. They've got fiber. Non-soluble fiber as well, and, and soluble fiber. But the microbiome loves that stuff. If you don't feed your microbiome fiber, i.e. prebiotics, you can't thrive. And so more recent research is actually geared towards prebiotics and the improvement in gut-related issues. And now obviously you can take it to the nth degree and talk about FODMAPs. And yes, FODMAPs will cause some you know issues with people who can't cope with FODMAPs. But vegetables, fruit and vegetables contain significant amounts of fiber, which for the general, um, general population is going to have a very positive impact on their gut microbiome that could have a positive impact on serotonin production. Serotonin production then goes across, crosses across the blood-brain barrier. You also have within fruit and vegetables, you have things like your B, B vitamins, which are crucial. You have magnesium, which is crucial for then production of, um, and also tryptophan. Tryptophan is going to again be a precursor to then serotonin. Serotonin is then your precursor to melatonin, which is why fruit and vegetables are, that's why they effectively have a positive impact on sleep because melatonin, which you can take as a supplement, although there are some negative consequences potentially associated with that, that's the end product. But it's all about trying to work out, well, how do you create that end product through, through a mechanism? And simply that mechanism is just eating more fruit and vegetables. So like, as Dustin said, like, we all know fruit and veggies are good for us. We're just not really sure why they're good. Well, how they're good for us. But that is just like two simple ways in terms of improving gut function, improving your gut microbiome, and then ultimately improving your brain function just through doing something as simple as eating fruit and veg, which is, I think, very cool, even though it's super simple. And probably most people are like, oh, well, yeah, it's a bit boring. You're just eating fruit and veg, but... It's actually the best thing you can do for you. So I think it's really cool. Um, are there any are okay. there any timing timing issues related to that? Does it matter when during the day you eat all of them? Just get them in, honestly. Like okay. I think spread them across. Like, you know, I, I changed the slides a little bit. Like one of the challenges I was going to have, if you really struggle with your sort of six to nine serves of vegetables, certainly, 
one of the habits that you can try and build in is, and certainly if you're seeing a red breakfast regularly throughout, like have salad with your breakfast. So if that's scrambled eggs, have it with a couple of big fists of baby spinach, arugula, um, leafy greens, like have that as your mainstay of carbohydrates with your red meal, with eggs, and ideally some pickled herring or smoked mackerel or something like that, if you want to get your omega threes. I know Karen's rolling her eyes, but yeah, you can have chicken, you can have some steak, you can have turkey, you can have white fish. Like, don't be limited to the notion of like breakfast, lunch, dinner, because nobody eats a piece of chicken at breakfast. Like, it's okay to eat a piece of chicken at breakfast if that's what you require in order to hit like your protein targets to get your vegetables in and hit your total carbohydrate amount. So I think don't don't be sort of limited by the stigma of what breakfast, lunch, and dinner should be. Um, in terms of sleep quality, though, like so, if you're someone who struggles with sleep, obviously we have a little bit of information in the guide about that. But obviously, you know, sleep hygiene, like removing screens, not having TVs in your room, um, removing bright light, don't have you know, don't look at your phone up to two hours before going to bed. Read a book, meditate, breath work, hot bath, all those sort of little things, but um, eating a high uh, high glycemic index carbohydrate source before going to bed can actually has been shown to improve sleep. And so if you think about it, you require B vitamins and magnesium and you want to sort of eat some sort of protein with it, then I would be thinking probably have a banana, um, have a banana. And if you want like something as simple, you could do like uh, a frozen banana blended with a scoop of chocolate whey and a little bit of Greek yogurt. So you get your protein, you get your high glycemic carbohydrates, and you also get a delicious dessert. And that that could be something that could actually impact your sleep in a positive way. Um, what else was I saying? Has anyone had their Omega Quant done? I think Elliot, you got yours done, didn't you? Yep, Lara, what was your level, Lara? If you don't mind me asking. <laughs> so the most recently it was 5.3. Yeah. But in the past, it's been 7.8. So that's just uh, changing habits around how much fish I eat, which is kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'll actually, I'll own up to this. So I got mine done and I think I was 12.2% and I dropped down to 8.9% because actually over the last two months, I haven't had any fish oils. Um, so my level is still fine, but it actually dropped because I think Pillar ran out of... Uh, fish oils and so i couldn't get any but it, it just shows you how much it can fluctuate even though i do eat oily fish so my levels still stay you know relatively high but in order for me to maintain the levels at which i'm trying to get to you know combat some you know systemic inflammation and some other stuff around cholesterol i actually need to be supplementing on top of sort of eating those oily fish so it's something to think about I and mean, it's the only way you know that is by actually doing the test. So I would a hundred percent like, like just do the test. Honestly, it, it's one of the best blood tests you can get done because you can actually do something about it. I was just really, um, fast I was really surprised at how fast it moved. And yeah. when I had it, I'd had it done and it was at like five, ate a bunch of fish, went up to seven, stopped eating fish, went down to five. And that was all pretty quick <laughs> but the cool thing about that and what we've been talking about is habits so habits are only as good as doing them consistently so whether you're training whether you're eating well whether you're eating fish whatever we're talking about like you have to be consistent with your habits otherwise you know it's that classic thing isn't it it's like oh i don't understand why i'm not as good a runner as i used to be and it's like well you don't do half as much running anymore and it's like, and then you're like, oh yeah, shit, I don't actually train that hard anymore. And it's like when I was training, and you often hear this from I, I hear this from athletes a lot. They're like, Oh, I used to be able to do this. And I'm like, Yeah, but that's the past. Like, what are you doing now? Like, you've got to be in the present and actually thinking about what you're doing now, because that's going to have a significant impact on whatever you're trying to achieve. So anyway. Right. Um, what was that? That was that. Has anyone had their red blood cell magnesium tested? Elliot, you're you're a very heavy sweater. What's yours look like? Uh, it's always been within normal ranges. 
Um, I couldn't tell you what the number is, but actually I'm probably getting my blood tests. Well, we'll see if I can squeeze it in this month before the race. It might be in December I d and just the annual ones coming up. But those numbers have actually always, there was a time when they were a little low. Um, and, you know, I use pH hydration more than you guys want me to, but I do live in Maui. Just as an and FYI it, for everyone, Elliot loses about, I don't know, 1.8 liters up to 2.2 liters per hour in sweat. So he, uh, it's, he's a um, sweater. It's well, I, yeah. Yeah, but thanks to, to you, I'll give the plug for doing all the sweat tests. I've really been working on that and drinking more. And if you've looked at my last couple of six hour bike rides, granted they were inside on the trainer. Yeah. Don't even ask. It was virtual reality course. Um, I drank a ton. In fact, the fueling app told me I drank too much. Um, and it, it's night and day how I feel when I'm done. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's feasible. For me to drink that much on the Ironman course, there's enough aid stations. It'll be interesting. This will be the first time I try to drink that much. So Arizona shouldn't be too hot, uh, relatively speaking. So we'll see. Yeah. But but point I'm making, having I saw a difference from say two three years ago. I was still within normal ranges, but I was at the low end of the range on sodium, magnesium, potassium, all those and they're all now pretty much in the middle of the range since I've made a point of dealing with that. And I, I think the really good thing with someone like Elliot, who I worked with for a long time and now he's, uh, you know, he's on pilot, but you know, he, his general nutrition, like there wasn't any, like, it wasn't like, you know, magic stuff. It was like consistency with eating lots of fruits and vegetables. And it's like, that's what I really want to get across to everyone. Get, like get your shit in order in terms of what's at home <laughs> in the fridge, in the pantry, because that's what makes the biggest difference. You can go searching, like don't get me started on something like AG one, like eat your fruit and veg. Like a, it doesn't cost you a hundred bucks. Well, it might cost you a hundred bucks a month, but at least you get, you know, you're full from it and you're fueled from it. Interestingly, I reached out to them uh, to get their full product analysis um, micro analysis because I know it's possible because we did this when I was at True Protein and True Protein actually has their full analysis on their greens product on their website and they tried to give me a spin off their website and they said it was escalated up the chain to chief product officer I haven't actually heard back from them yet but I'm going to chase it and I'm going to get that full analysis and I'm going to do a full thing on it so stand by on that if anyone's taking AG1 I'd be interested to know um so anyway, yeah, if AJ1 wants to hear that and they want to actually send me that full analysis, I'm, I'm looking forward <laughs> to receiving. Um, Cindy said, when focusing on strength training this period, is there a better time to have protein either before or after the session or do both? Um, look, Cindy, the key is eating your total amount of protein across the day and across the week and across the month. So certainly make sure your total intake is on point. Um 60 look somewhere about 60 90 minutes before if you can have a decent amount of protein probably for you somewhere like 20 or 30 grams is going to be um, a good option just to feel fueled i did write an article for training peaks recently which you can have a look at which i think is titled nutrition and strength training for triathletes um, and it talks about the timing of nutrition uh, for that actually i can pull it up i'll put the link in here while i'm talking um if the training sessions aren't really long, certainly if they're less than 60 minutes and you have less than 10 sets for multiple exercises, you don't need to eat during. But certainly, um, Cindy, eat your protein. Again, it's going to be somewhere like 30 to 40 grams of protein within ideally an hour, but up to two hours after, um, after finishing that weights training session. Uh, let me just get this. Uh, nutrition and strength. So 
I'll pop it in the chat. But um, there it is there. You can have a read and let me know what you think. Um, so that's that. Cindy, I had a question about collagen. Lara, previous mentioned not to have collagen with caffeine. Is is there any collagen cream or products that you just possibly? I don't. I haven't actually seen the research on that. You probably just reach out to Elizabeth. Is Lara still on? Oh yeah. But, um, reach out to on chat to Elizabeth and know it. Um, yeah. I'm not 100% sure what the research is on that, so I'm not going to comment. Um, Cindy, your omega level was 5.3. Uh, went to 8 plus in two months. Fantastic. There you go. So there's a really good one. And, you know, Cindy, we want to get that up to sort of above, up around 12%. So keep supplementing and keep eating. Um, would you recommend a daily vitamin, multivitamin? Uh, Laura, where's Laura? Is Laura still on here? Oh, yeah, there. Um, do you take one? Um, ironically enough, I've been taking athletic greens and treating it as a daily multivitamin. <laughs> because that's what it is. It's a very expensive multivitamin that's green and makes you feel good, probably from a mental standpoint, because it's green. And I'm sure there's some uh psycho sort of uh psychology behind that. Um it's a multivitamin. Look, there is arguments back and forth for athletes that a multivitamin is like fortifying your diet and sort of you know if you're in heavy training and lots of intensity then yeah it's a little bit of insurance i don't think there's anything wrong with taking a multivitamin um i would say before taking the multivitamin and reaching for it do you have the basics sorted so are you eating that six to nine serves of fruit and veg every day if you're doing that there's a good possibility you probably don't need that multivitamin which most of it will end up in the toilet anyway because they're all water soluble vitamins. So, yeah, yeah, I would be specific with the vitamins, uh, the micronutrition that you take. So, that's where again, coming back to you know, red blood cell testing for magnesium, getting vitamin D levels tested. And certainly, if all of you are in the northern hemisphere, you should all be going to get a general blood test at this time of year in November. And this should be every November. And and then six months later in May, getting it repeated. But things like red blood cell magnesium for all of you, I would get, and certainly for all the female athletes, but male as well, your ferritin levels, your transferrin saturation, um, just get a standard CBC complete blood count. So you see what your hemoglobin levels are, because then you'll know if you're anemic or iron deficient, iron deficient, anemic, so on. Um, what else would I get done? Uh, if you can get active B12 done, but at least serum B12, uh, what else would you get done? Your Omega Quant, which I just order rather than getting a doctor to do it because they won't know what to order. Um, but they're sort of your basics that you get done. And you should be getting that done now. And then if you were deficient in vitamin D or you're just moderately sufficient, then start supplementing with vitamin D and hitting vitamin D in a fairly decent amount because you're about to go into deep, dark winter and you're not going to create any vitamin D. So that's how I'd be approaching it rather than doing it um certainly things like you know some of the micronutrients in a multivitamin you could argue that maybe you can't get but you know again fruit and vegetables should include things like nuts you know one brazil nut will supply you with enough selenium per day you know and that's it's just one of those habits like i i don't know if they, does everyone have a brazil nut every day it's a weird habit of mine but it's something i do but if you want your ovaries and your testes to sort of look after themselves, then probably have a have a Brazil nut every day. It's very important. So something like that, you know, and you can just put in your overnight oats. So so simple. It just, you know, it's about five grams of fat and you know, it's packed full of goodness. Um so yeah, Laura, get a blood test, check if you actually need it. Maybe save yourself, put the hundred dollars towards some delicious berries and other delicious fruits and veggies that you know maybe would be a lot nicer to eat. That would be my take on it. But yeah, okay. I'm a skeptic. Maybe if AG1 pay me as much as they pay Huberman, then uh, you know, I'd probably be recommending it. But, yeah. <laughs> um, good, yeah. Uh that's gotta be my order yeah, but yeah, yeah. But can't wait to return to just the true range. Yeah. Cool. Uh any other questions? Shane, are you an Aussie? 
he's on, he's on yeah way. man i am i'm over in Very america good. a few for a few years yeah where are you based i'm at it uh florida near destin oh, nice. eglin air force base down in florida oh nice did you race on the yeah. weekend no no i didn't i had i did chattanooga uh okay. for the fall a few few weeks ago well, like two months ago now maybe <laughs> Uh, yeah, nice. Yeah, how we're going to get through any of Panama. Say again? How did Chattanooga go? Yeah, not too bad for my first full distance. Uh, I've only just got into racing maybe eight or nine months ago. I did the yeah, Chattanooga cool. 70.3 in May and backed it up with the full in September for the uh, round out the lookout challenge. So, yeah, yeah fantastic. Yeah, so you know True, uh, True Protein pretty well? Yeah, 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 pretty well. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's, you know, I know I bang on about it a lot. I think it's easily the best <laughs> protein supplement yeah, on the planet. Like it's just tastes the best <laughs> and it's best quality. So yeah, yeah, happy definitely. to be proven wrong, but it is very good. So uh, very good. Nice to meet you. Um, James, you had a question for estimating protein using the fuel in hand method. Are we estimating in raw or cooked? Uh, it's a, you're going to look, you're probably splitting hairs here um i usually do it in the raw version james and what he's referring to is hands of protein and again i changed this out of the thing i was going to talk about protein i know i talked about grams um as of grams per kilo body weight and if you whatever you weigh in pounds is what you should be aiming for in grams you could split that up as well and just say look as an absolute minimum for everybody there aim for at least three hands of protein per day um, and if you weigh over 150 pounds, aim for four hands of protein per day. Um, and again, James, like I get it. Like sometimes you're going to be out and you'll see like cooked chicken, you know, and it is it 200 grams of cooked chicken or raw chicken. Again, it's an estimate. I wouldn't get too, too hung up on it. I think if you're hitting sort of that four hands of protein for you or a little bit more, then you'll be doing really well. Yes, Scott. Does that make sense? Did you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So some of the, uh, the challenges is when you, you're out, especially eating, and the, the protein is mixed. So, you know, it's like, um, you know, beans with, with beef or something like that. And estimating those kind of dishes can be kind of tricky. Yeah, it is. Look, and I guess that's why it's an estimation and it's a guesstimation at best. And, you know, if you're, if you're out, I think we say like, you know, with your beans, estimate them as a cupped hand of beans, um, you know, those sources of pulses or lentils or, uh, you know, um, yeah, pulses and lentils and whatnot, then, you know, a cupped hand is probably going to have about, you know, five to 10 grams of protein in it. And if that's mixed in with another good quality protein source, do your best to guesstimate and then just adjust it in the app, you know, adjusting the serving sizes of the, the cupped hands of carbs or the, the serves of hands of protein and just adjust it to like half or three quarters or one appropriately. It's hard. That probably comes back to the habit of learning to, you know, cooking at home as often as you can. And I get it with work. It's not always possible, but certainly trying to cook at home and control the controllables. If, again, your goal is very much centered around losing weight or um, improving body composition, then that is probably one of the best ways to start. Cool. Um, we've gone over. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, Eric, I haven't met you. Sarah, I haven't met you before. Violet, I haven't met you. But uh, and Hillary, I haven't met you. But nice to meet you. Uh, I can't see you, and your microphones are muted. But uh, very nice to meet you, and uh, thank you for being part of Fuel In. And hopefully today helped a little bit with you know thinking about how you can structure Q4 and what you can do with it, and. Uh, you know, if you've got any questions, just feel free to hit me up in chat uh, within Fuel In or send an email through. Um, you can email me at scott at fuel in uh, And if, if you want to do a consultation with me or one of the team, you can just either book that directly through the app or uh, through the website. I'm happy to help. So cool. Uh, well, 
other than that, if there's no more questions, I'll say goodbye. Great to see you all, um, as always. And hopefully it was informative and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Bye-bye.